Hello, dear colleagues and friends. It's a pleasure and a honor for me to introduce Carl Knappert's uh, keynote lecture. In particular, as I am an archaeologist working on the Mediterranean and on connectivity, and Carl Knappert's research has strongly shaped our present view of material culture and of networks as materialized through archaeological data. He holds the Walter Graham Homer Thompson Chair in Aegean Prehistory at the University of Toronto, where he also directs the Mediterranean Archaeology Collaborative Specialization. In his trajectory, I remind his PhD at the University of Cambridge 1997, during a period in which theoretical discussion was evolving from post-processualism to agency theory and the discussion about materiality entanglements. His research has an historical side on Minoan pottery, and he recently developed his field research in the Minoan town of Palekastro, with a focus on the processes of urbanization and landscape in Crete and the Aegean area. And he has a theoretical side, which we know may be even better, that is on material culture theory and network approaches in archaeology. What is absolutely relevant, I think, is the strict integration of the perspective in his study of Mediterranean connectivity. And so his reflection about social network analysis and uh, the connectivity is going on, is proceeding. And I only wanted to quote uh, uh, something from a paper that he published this year uh, in the book by Liv Donnellan edited by Liv Donnellan on archaeological networks and social interaction. There he says that network analysis does not have an adequate set of models for addressing the micro scale or face-to-face -face interactions, and that this limitation is in part because of a lack of consideration of the active role of artifacts in mediating such interactions. So we know that his keynote will be basically uh, discussing a factor of scale and so looking at these recent considerations he uh, raised I very much look forward to hearing how far he has already moved in his theoretically oriented path of reflection about archaeology thank you good evening everyone. Thank you very much, Alessandro, uh, for that kind introduction. Um, to give you my talk in a nutshell, um, I want to uh, talk about our current experience of networking, then say a few words about sociology's viewpoint on networks. Use that to think about the ways we approach ancient networks, and finally, to come back to the present and reflect upon our network lives. So in our everyday experience through this pandemic, we act as if there are two kinds of networking that are separable. The in-person networks that connect us locally and the virtual net networks that connect us globally. If the former are small, slow, and resilient, the latter are massive, fast, and fragile. So this distinction between slow and fast is, is um, kind of what's uh, the, the purpose behind my title. But though we may concede that the pandemic has accentuated these differences by forcing us to constrain in-person interactions while expanding virtual connectivity, it also seems likely that we were already thinking like this. How else could the transition have occurred so rapidly? How else could conferences like this have pivoted by completely removing the in-person element? While detached, contained, and isolated in our bunkers, completely unnetworked at one level, we already believed we could remain networked to one another. But this separation of the micro scale from the macro scale is not only something we experience, 
but also a problem we encounter analytically. If we turn to the most relevant field for such questions, namely sociology, there is an acute recognition of the possible analytical split between micro and macro scales. And such a split is quite pronounced, even within a subfield concerned specifically with networking, i.e. social network analysis. Emily Erickson, a sociologist, argues that and this, here I quote, there are in fact two distinct theoretical frameworks that animate much of the work on social networks. She calls them relationalism and formalism. With relationalism, the content of ties between individuals is crucial to the formation of social networks. That is to say, the very basis of a tie matters. Erickson uses the example of Maclean's work on Renaissance Florentine networks, in which he shows that particular cultural frames, such as honor, were manipulated to construct relationships. And if we think about friendship networks today, the cultural frame might be, for teenagers, TikTok. With formalism, on the other hand, it is abstracted forms that come before content. Marriage would be one example that is a form which may contain different content, a wide range of feelings, and which can be analyzed structurally somewhat regardless of that content, which might be like connecting up um, teenagers in a school in networks solely on the basis of their, of their structural connection, their belonging to that school. What might, we, what might we say about these two approaches? Relationalism seems to be bottom-up and more micro-scale, while formalism is top-down and macro-scale. What Erickson is doing in distinguishing between these two theoretical frameworks is warning against simple attempts to reconcile them. She is showing that the differences between them are quite deep and actually go back to Simo and Moss. But what's the relevance for archaeology? Well, social network analysis has been a major influence, of course, on the uptake of network archaeology. And it seems that it is the formalist rather than the relationalist framework that has been most prevalent. So let us just see how this is the case. Network analysis has seen quite a boom in the last decade in our field. It has proven invaluable in describing and explaining relations, connections, and interactions across a range of settings from uh, prehistory uh, to ancient history, um, even more modern historical contexts, and across many parts of the globe. One of the main trends that can be identified is an overriding focus on regional and interregional scales of interaction, whereby sites are the nodes in the network and their interactions are the links in the network. We might briefly look at some network uh, visualiz visualizations from various studies um, to uh, see how this is the case. Uh, we could look at the uh, really groundbreaking study by Barbara Mills, Matt Peoples, and, and other colleagues in the US Southwest uh, from about uh, 1250 to 1450 and um, with a huge database and able to come up with really convincing historical explanations for phenomena such as migration. Um, we might also mention the work of uh, Mark Golitko and colleagues um, in the Maya world, looking at obsidian uh, sources and uh, where those different forms of obsidian are used site by site, and then uh, coming up with uh, networks on that basis. And we could talk about, we could go to the Baltic and Soren Sinbach's uh, fascinating work on uh, Viking networks. And in the Mediterranean, there are various examples, but we might just mention Emma Blake's uh, study of uh, networks uh, that prefigure uh, the Roman world that uh, emerge 
over time in the Bronze Age and Iron Age in the Italian uh, peninsula. We might, risking oversimplification, call all of these examples of formalism. Such formalism is perhaps a natural consequence of the influence of social network analysis. There is another set of influences upon network approaches in archaeology, more from the direction of social physics um, and network science. Here we can see the impact of computer science, formal modeling, the attractiveness of big data, or in archaeological, uh, in archaeology, I suppose it's sort of quasi big data in most cases, and even a quest for explanation over understanding that comes more with the territory of the natural sciences. These influences have, have perhaps cemented the association of network archaeology with uh, formalism. And here, I'd really like to acknowledge the input of Angus Moll uh, of Leiden, uh, with whom I've been working on some of these questions for a review, uh, kind of re a review paper um, that will appear in um, a new Oxford uh, handbook of archaeological network research uh, with these editors, with dozens of chapters uh, that I think will be um, uh, very interesting. However, we must not forget the relationalist strand of thinking identified by Emily Erickson, the sociologist. This theoretical framework of relationalism is also present in archaeology. It can be found in the work on relational personhood by scholars such as Chris Fowler and Joe Brook, inspired in part by Strathern's uh, individual, and in approaches to agency that draw on actor network theory. Yet these more interpretive approaches in archaeology tend not to engage all that much with network uh, perspectives. One uh, strong exception is the work of Astrid van Oyen, who takes such um, interpretive perspectives and seeks to put them in dialogue with more formal network approaches. She is critical of the latter for their tendency to assume pre-existing categories. For van Oyen, it's important to understand how categories come into being relationally specifically in her research on Terra Sigillata. We might also cite here the work of Gisli Palsen on Icelandic historical land registers. He too recognizes the need for a relationalist perspective and identifies assemblage theory as promising in this regard, characterizing it as a qualitative network approach. However, Palsen believes that that it is quite possible to both be concerned with matters of agency and the bottom-up generation of relationships and conduct formal network analysis. And in this, he differs somewhat from Van Oyen. While Paulson seeks connections with assemblage theory, another related approach is seen in the work of Angus Moll. I just mentioned, looking to combine the relationalism of entanglement theory with more formalist approaches. One could cite not only his work with Ian Hodder on formalizing tanglegrams as networks, but also that with Floris Keenan that explicitly seeks to link up, seeks to link up micro and macro scales in an analysis of the colonial entanglements of the Spanish-Caribbean encounter. While these two studies on Iceland and the Caribbean use historical documents, my next few examples are based on artifacts. A fascinating study by Geomi and Peoples looks at artifact classes found at Pueblo Bonito in Chaco Canyon and examines their co-occurrences and their room-by-room -room associations. The authors are able in this way to identify two scales of ritual behavior through their practice-based assemblage-oriented approach, though they do not use assemblage in the same Delandian theoretical sense as Paulson. 
Camilla Mazzucato, um, completing her PhD at Stanford, in her study of the Neolithic site of Chetelhuyuk in Anatolia, also takes this kind of micro-level approach by connecting up buildings and the objects and features found within them. Houses that share similar finds are linked together and are suggestive of sub-communities within the settlement. Her approach, though strong on network methodology, is also very much compatible with the entanglement perspective developed by Ian Hodder. Lastly, I might mention a recent University of Toronto PhD by Paula Giorgiadi on Aegean Bronze Age exchange networks with a method that ranges from the micro scale of particular artifact co-presences within a site to regional level patterns. Do such archeological efforts at epistemological bridge building succeed in overcoming the kinds of worries Ericsson has about the incompatibility of formalism and relationalism? They differ principally in their position on the status of a priori social forms, a quote, such that, and I quote again, formalism embraces and relationalism largely rejects the initial premise of the existence of the a priori. So looking at the slide, one might see that it's really a, a question of saying that formalism says yes to a priori social forms and relationalism essentially says uh, no. Erickson argues that any attempt at bridging formalism and relationalism has to address the underlying tensions. And she sees a few different approaches or ways out of this impasse, um, such as simply choosing one or the other approach, allowing for theoretical pluralism, or coming up with a new theory that, can, that is overarching and can encompass both. What is interesting about the recent bridging approaches in archeology span the studies I mentioned, Paulson, uh, Moll, and others, is that they seek to encompass both, albeit without a new theory per se. So have they just not got to grips with the fundamental theoretical tensions between formalism and relationalism, or is there something else going on? Perhaps to some degree, the theoretical tensions do need more work. But it may also be that archaeologists have cottoned on to the key role of material culture in mediating between structure and culture, or structure and agency, or close-knit personal networks and more far-flung far virtual ones. And it would seem they are much more alert to this than sociologists. It may be by accident rather than design for the identification of structure relies upon material culture when all we have are artifacts. We really don't have any choice. Anyway, what happens when we use material culture in this way and the above approaches are centered on material culture is that we implicitly recognize that material culture is simultaneously both form and content. Artifacts encapsulate both the categorical and contingent, they capture structure and agency. An individual artifact is to some degree the result of an a priori social form, while also being the outcome of a particular individual moment of production with all the accompanying contingencies. I might just briefly illustrate this with an image of some Aegean Bronze Age pottery. You can see here a typology of various jugs, and there are a lot of different types of jugs from a site in concrete in the Middle Bronze Age. And if one looks at the drawing in the top left the, um, of a particular kind of jug, it has 
a, a kind of a, a formal existence. Um, at the same time, you can see the different, some different examples of this jug, and one can see quite a lot of variation, even while they all, in a sense, conform uh, to those uh, typological characteristics. So there is this sort of a priori form, but also the embodiment of contingency and agency in each example. Material culture is in this way subtly communicative, a medium, if you like, with both form and content, or as Ericsson might also put it, both structure and culture. We can also see this combination as one between local and virtual, because a typology or a set of types is um, to some extent virtual, uh, or between micro and macro. Um, so if archaeological network research is actively showing how a material culture is the bridge between close-knit networks and wider virtual networks, then how can we flip this back onto our everyday experience? Widely differing scales do articulate, and it is objects that play a key mediatory role. We are slowly learning that the initial optimism of remaining perfectly well networked, even while bunkered, was misplaced. Perhaps the problems that come with the separation of scales felt acutely during this pandemic might be attributable to a disassociation from artifact space. The Wall Street Journal reported recently that companies are no longer so sure that their remote workers are performing tasks just as well online. And it is processes of apprenticing junior staff, especially, that seem to suffer. And this is what this slide is trying to convey. Perhaps it is that in such learning scenarios, the importance of shared material culture in scaffolding interaction is particularly strong. Maybe it will dawn on us more and more that the virtual network can only work when tethered to the in-person and in ways that have a material culture continuum. The virtual may piggyback on the memory of the in-person for a while, but it doesn't seem to be, to me, sustainable or resilient in the way that in-person networks are, particularly when the associated materialities differ so much. I think back to the pivot to online teaching in mid-March. My small graduate class was able to work pretty well, I think, online for the last three classes of the term, but only because we had gone through the entire year prior to that in person and in a shared classroom space where we leave many of our personal materialities behind, though not all of them, of course. Starting only virtually seems like an entirely different proposition when the materiality of Zoom, let's say, if we can talk of its virtual materiality, is anything but equitable. Perhaps it should have been obvious, but the different scales of networks are not so easily separable. They are interconnected and interdependent, partly because of material culture. There are not two independent network scales, macro and micro, even if pandemic responses hoped or pretended that there were. We have to nurture small-scale, face-to-face relations that are mediated by material culture for the virtual macro network to function. And this is um, from Gel's Strathernograms paper, which I think is just fascinating, and I've written about it uh, recently, um, just showing how you know, objects can mediate exchange face-to-face, -face, and then how through that object, that immediate relationship can be sort of converted into a much wider um, sort of cascading network. In a sense, what I am getting at here is the way in which we move from private to public or from mac micro to macro. And yes, portable artifacts can play a role in this with their mobility. But I also want to briefly feature here 
the role of fixed material culture, or what we might also think of as the built environment. Another word for this is architecture. And architectural theorists have thought um, quite deeply um, through the ways in which what is built, which is after all material culture, both emerges from and guides interaction. These days, with so much talk of bubbles, I cannot help but think of the Spheres trilogy by Peter Sloterdijk, the first volume of which is the aptly named Bubbles, as you see here. But I want to bring in another architect, really, and talk about Lydia Calipoliti. She is the author of a 2018 book, The Architecture of Closed Worlds, and a recent piece in Eflux called Zoom In, Zoom Out. If we contain ourselves in built environments that are closed off, as illustrated in this piece she uses in her book, House for Cocoa's A Piece of Nature, then the transition from private to public is completely obviated. We could, I suppose, live in a series of bubbles or, or bunkers like this, um, a kind of modularity that either implies total disconnection, if each bubble does its own thing, or a thorough hierarchical control, if each bubble repeats. But what exists between each bubble is nothing. There is no materiality, just absence, or as in this image, just virus, I suppose. However, in an open system, as opposed to these uh, closed worlds, with flow between cells or between bubbles, there has to be an architecture for such connectivity. And thinking back to the ceramic typology slide I showed, architecture too is simultaneously a priori social form on the one hand and contingency on the other. Both bubbles or bunkers and the spaces between them arise out of interaction and yet are structured. I'm reminded of the work of another architect, Lars Spoybrook, who has differentiated between the more structured and modular forms of classical architecture and the more emergent processes of the Gothic, and he calls this, in fact, a Gothic ontology. Interestingly, some of the archaeological work I mentioned above, that of Geomian peoples on the one hand at Pueblo Bonito and of uh, Matsukato at Chetelhuyuk, is actually thinking about architectural spaces in conjunction with portable material culture and in the process navigating, I think, between formalism and relationalism in their approaches. And I'd just like to uh, finish by saying, I think we can learn from our archeological practice and its attention to the crucial role of material culture and the built environment as we try to find our way through our relationships near and far in this moment. Um, thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to um, trying to answer any questions or um, respond to any comments you may have. Thank you very much, Carl, for this inspiring lecture and uh, Yes, you touched a lot of uh, aspects, not uh, even much, much wider than our own discipline. Yeah, I think that um, we will get questions anyway. You, uh, colleagues that uh, were hearing the lecture, can ask questions through the uh, chat box, and this can uh, be reported by me, and so we will have the the questions going on. I will would start with uh, with only one point that uh, um, I think is uh, um, can introduce somehow the debate. And uh, well, when you are speaking of formalism on one side and relationalism on the other, and when you are showing the relation with between the uh, typology and the uh, single part that can have variation and variability. Um, 
we are discussing something that maybe didn't enter so much the debate so far. Uh, we have the, the, the model by Saussure, our uh, model, the one that has uh, something which is a rule, which is the lung, and the way that each expression come out, the, the paro parole, the, the way that texts, uh, that, that, that uh, people express themselves in this continuous variability of language. So is this related also to the idea of relationalism and formalism that you brought by? Because I think that the, the point of the uh, theoretical debate is that the French discussion is somehow left uh, often out of it. But the, I think that we have also something to get from the model from Saussure uh, of the language. Yes, uh, that, that's a really good point. Thank you, Alessandro. I, um, I'm reacting a little bit to some of the recent work that suggests that um, you know, everything is really in a state of becoming, uh, which you know, I largely agree with. Um, and um, that may make sense for certain kinds of material culture, but somehow these assemblages um, in the Aegean, in you know, Bronze Age and, and later, um, there does seem to be rather a strong sense of repetition and rec very recognizable forms that uh, suggests to me that there is some sort of fixity of idea around a particular type so that it's, it's replicated, not just on one site, but across, across many sites. So um, this sense of the type in a way, not just the sort of modern typology, but a, a sense of like a, an emic type, I guess, as well, um, may not have been very um, popular recently. Um, and uh, I guess in, in later periods, a sort of strong reaction against uh, Beasley and uh, those kinds of approaches. Um, but I guess it could be taken as a kind of uh, argument for a, a grammar of, of sorts. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about it um, a little bit more like an ecology, I guess. Um, but yes, I guess one could push it towards grammar and then the sense of uh, um, a generative uh, long, uh, which then varies with uh, uh, with parole, that works against somewhat the sort of Persian model um, of, of semiotics that I have uh, generally preferred to work with. Um, but there's um, maybe there's there's room for looking at the the tensions between those productively. Yes, questions are not coming out so much, so. Uh, I, I would go further uh, with with something uh, discussing. It seems to be two people discussing, but I hope that questions are coming anyway. But in in your deeper discussion of the situation of uh, or wider discussion of our situation of the lockdowns and of the bunkers or the bubbles, uh, so you argue that uh, materiality and its agency is something that is so much uh, well integrated. Uh, I don't want to use it here entangled because it is a little bit or even entangled with human experience that we cannot do without it. Yes. It is necessary. Yes, I for, suppose. For us as we are. Hmm. I mean, I've been I've been thinking particularly um, for a, a, a book that uh, I recently published about containing and um, what that as a kind of logic or strategy does for human individuals or groups, and particularly just trying to think through different kinds of burial uh, in terms of containing, thinking about reliquaries a little bit, not my specialty, but in terms of containing houses um, and containment. And th there is a, a sort of a, a, a renewed interest in containing. Um, there are some interesting uh, uh, papers uh, in a few different disciplines. So then um, with, the, with the pandemic, um, I, <laughs> it dawned on me that, oh, <laughs> there's a whole issue of, of, uh, of containment here. Um, 
and of course you know it's it's a rather common word in relation to to viruses you know there's there was a whole debate with the the foot and mouth crisis in in the uk about 20 years ago about what can one contain it's very hard to contain a virus so then we have to contain ourselves but there's a there's a materiality to that of course um so i sort of had these ideas um floating around and then i, I came across um this quite interesting approach from this this architect uh lydia calabuliti um so I, I just felt kind of um uh inclined to include that tonight um because it seemed a way of of thinking about material culture across scales and what containment does at at a particular scale i guess and uh and e excluding other broader scales of interaction sorry it's a rather rambling response but... and uh, i i still go on so we go on debating more or less sure, I'm happy but the, the 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 last point that i wanted to ask you is this about the scale so you spoke of uh fast and slow that can may remind us also long durée and contingency or uh, event something like this which was in this case phrased on three levels which were the, the, the long durée the contingency and the event but on the other side also the scales that we apply often are micro meso and macro or something like that on a three part height way but while you spoke more of a dualism but i think that you were not satisfied of this dualism at all we you thought that there was more much more continuity between the scales no isn't it yes i i mean i've i've tried to i mean while recognizing that you know differentiating these scales is is a somewhat artificial process but but recognizing a you know a whole series of scales uh obviously reducing that to micro and macro is 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 way too simple um but i, I just wanted to sort of slightly polemically get the 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 point across that you know if one has a very micro scale of like uh very close networks and um i guess the the macro scale of these virtual networks in a way maybe it's the meso scale that's that's like completely fallen uh uh fallen away um the sort of community level urban level interaction if one can put it like that um so yes i mean i really should try to think through some of these issues um not that i understand contemporary society well enough but um through some of these issues with a with a more subtle um scalar approach i think yeah for sure but a question in, in the end came out and i think you can see in the chat that is in practical terms do you think that there is anything as too many categories it was she was juana valdez tollet making this question in practical terms do you think that there is anything like to the too many categories um yes I, i mean i suppose um the manager of a supermarket might say there aren't there can never be too many categories i mean there are what 40,000 different products in a in a supermarket um but i think if if we're thinking about archaeological processes of categorization then that's it's a it's a abstractive process i suppose um and the idea is to reduce the complexity that's out there um so uh for those categories to to be useful to us um i suppose they should be limited um to some degree um but then one gets into the the question of to what extent you know our modern categories map well onto whatever ancient categories they may have existed um uh, maybe i'm not quite getting um the the gist of of the question there but i'm i'm happy to try again. maybe maybe juan avaldez talent wants to get a little bit uh, uh refine the question a little bit if it is necessary that is too many categories where because you you are all obviously speaking of the classical also discussion emicetic Uh, how is the fit between our categories and the past categories uh, i think carl now but i don't think that this too many categories was 
about this argument. Um, but at, at the same time, uh, I found mm, uh, very, very clear the example that you made with the, the typology, because it is again something that uh, in the end we all archaeologists have at some time uh, went through. And so this is uh, absolutely clear for, uh, for us. Uh, but um, so when you said now that uh, categories maybe are too many and you think that they should be less, you think something like an Occam's razor that we should apply to our and cut away what is too much just to to get to it to, to a core of significant categories. This is what you mean. Well, I mean, I'm just uh, anybody who's done ceramic photography will know that there are lumpers and splitters, and that you can. Yeah, yeah. Can also, play. with evolution, we have lumpers and little splitters. Yes. Um, so, yeah, uh, you can just go back and forth between those. Oh, I see. Questions are in stage, right? Yes. Ah, okay. Uh, but is any other question coming out? Because I I didn't want to. Oh, okay. Is that here? Uh, is... Kaidaska? This is Juana Valdez Tulet, which came back. When you are describing an artifact regarding its physical attributes, you may define categories for it, which you will then study through this relational and interconnected process. But would too much this description bias our aim? Oh, okay. Um, so, right. So some of this work that I've been describing, like uh, Geomi and, and Peoples, for example, uh, they do a lot of um, processing, if you like, categor uh, categorization processing before doing the network analysis, right? So they're actually comparing classes. Uh, so they'll have classes like turquoise and, and shell beads and, and, and whatever. Um, in the same way, the, the Mills et al. work came up with like, I think, 25 different sort of ceramic wares that were then sort of, uh, you know, coded from site to site. So you have to be able to uh, do that kind of uh, categorization work. Um, to to you know make things function in the in the network analysis, so of course there are there are choices there and uh, a kind of a reduction. Um, so it, I presume they chose what they chose to according to the questions they had in mind. Um, and there is the, yeah, I'm sorry, because no, there are sorry. endless endless physical attributes of, of of even a shirt right that one could endlessly describe, um, but you don't want to do that. There was the, the question by Eric Krohn, which is about the remarks on types, which is connected maybe with the former one. Can I ask the speaker to reflect a little more on typology and how it will hold up with the renewed interests for structures and materials? Uh, for example, ecology and object-oriented approaches. How typology is coping with this different uh, view of the of the record, maybe. So I don't know. Yeah, I think um, just off the top of my head, I think there has to be a sort of a, a back and forth uh, between a real relational perspective and then a more kind of object centered perspective, if you like, so that one might uh, categorize um, a particular kind of pot, let's say, in a certain way. But then when one looks at its associations, um, one might you know, alter you know, a sort of assemblage approach, look at its relations, one might adjust one's thinking about what that category really consists of. Um, I, I guess one example, thinking of a, of a session uh, earlier today about uh, miniaturization and, and miniatures. I mean, you, know, you, you, you obviously pay attention to the specific uh, category of the miniature and, and document its its characteristics, but then it's in a necessary relationship. Well, it's probably in a relationship with another kind of object of which it is a reduced scale version. I mean, it may not be, but it often is. It's what miniature implies usually. 
so then you you're already thinking relationally with that kind of uh, category of object. Um, yeah, I guess that, that's what I'd say to 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 that. And then there are two questions which are related, which are about the scale problem. Mm -hmm. The first is by Biserka Gaidarska, which is to what extent can you stretch the scale of small words to make them larger and closer to the macro or shrink them to be closer to the micro? And the other question by Signe Bafford, uh, Bafford uh, is how to do, uh, do you distinguish between macro and, and, and macro and micro, macro and micro? Uh, when does micro become macro? So they are connected. Uh, how, how is the relation and the progress between micro and macro and vice versa? Yeah, um, I mean, I'm just uh, made to think of a really excellent work by Tom Tartaron uh, on the Mycenaean um, uh, world in you know the Aegean Late Bronze Age, and he talks about uh, local coastscapes. I mean, sort of thinking geographically, but also organizationally, I guess. Coastscapes. Uh, his next scale up is something like small worlds. I think a collection of sort of local coastscapes and then up to intra-regional inter-regional um but you know so he's devised that with his particular um sort of circumstances in mind um uh my student uh former student paula georgiade who who recently defended uh has tried to sort of uh use that for crete and you might think it's the same part of the world but it, it doesn't quite work uh, in quite the same way. So, um, yeah, I, I'm not sure it's possible to sort of say, you know, the micro scale, if one's thinking in those sorts of spatial terms, should be this, and the, the meso scale should be this. Um, I mean, it, it also, he's also thinking about the transport technology that's available. So it's, it's immediately cultural and, and uh, infrastructural as well, right? So it, it would, matter if um, the, your boat technology or your your road technology uh, would would shrink or expand uh, the scale of interaction um, so I think you know there, there's already a sort of rather complex imbrication of of like geography and technology even just at that initial level of discussion so I think that to answer, sort of try to answer Berserker's point, I think that's a way in which you know scales might might be shrunk or expanded according to kind of available infrastructures in in broad terms. And do you think that they have also a connection with the individual experience? That is, some smaller scale is connected more to the individual agency and the practice, uh, and there is a macro scale that. Uh, goes beyond the or beyond as becomes as such a complex sum of individual agencies that that requires a, a jump in size um certainly in terms of what tartaron was doing with i mean it's really uh, quite focused on maritime interaction i mean he was really think trying to think about the experience of the local coastscape and who might be using those coastscapes and what kinds of you know infrastructure they'd be using and then thinking that the any like uh, interregional interaction would require would have a whole different set of experiences probably with you know maybe specialized merchants and sailors and uh, a, a rather different um, I mean still with an experiential aspect to it um, so not you know entirely virtual um, because of the particular infrastructures in play. And then there is a question by Robert Staniuk, uh, which is going back to the idea of everything being in the making. Uh, our ex established networks affect the, how we have been dealing with the changing COVID circumstances. For example, in teaching or jobs, how do you think current networks will undergo change due to the lockdown? And do you think it will provide us uh, sorry, it will provide us with analogies for changing past interactions. Hmm. Um, 
Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think one thing that's, that's really, and I'm not sure if this is really going to ad address it except obliquely, one thing that struck me in, in discussions with uh, colleagues in the university about using um, Zoom, let's say, or whatever platform, is that it, it does bring up all kinds of issues around uh, of, of equity, um, of different students having different access to resources and different uh, positionality in respect to public spaces or semi-public spaces within the home. And so certainly my university is, is, or my department has sort of recommended not asking students, they should not be asked to have their, their cameras on if they don't want to. Um, so that sort of um, uh, intrusion into private space or, or throwing light on the materiality of private public space, I think is is quite interesting in ways I hadn't really anticipated. Um, and so that's, I sort of hinted at that with uh, the sort of mid virtual materiality of, of, of Zoom, but I haven't really thought about that enough and I'm not specialized in that. Um, and yeah, how well networks um, change, I assume we'll all get very sick of this and we'll clamor for for in-person um, interaction. And uh, again, I mentioned, you know, teaching, apprenticeship, learning. Um, one might not think of the, the structure of a boring classroom as particularly important, but but perhaps we'll learn that it is. Not, not to mention, you know, practical classes, labs, this kind of thing. Um, so as for analogies for changing past interactions, I mean, I, I was really, coming at this from the other way around in terms of, you know, actually the way that we think archaeologically about past interactions um, and this, um, you know, recognition of the necessary recognition of the structure and role of materials as is, is, can maybe help us think through that and recognize how important architecture, built environment, all these things are um, for us today. But I, yeah, I'm not, I don't know how over time we'll rethink how we think about past interactions through this. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know. Maybe, maybe this uh, this this is so much infor uh, information related to our communication now. It is so uh, abstract somehow that uh, it may help maybe to to think about uh, situations of uh, uh, limited communication. But I don't think 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 that there is a direct connection because it is so different what is happening now. But I think that we can. Think of something like uh, small flows of information, very directional, coming from one point to another, and then experience which is going on in a partitioned way. This can have some some reflection, maybe. But I don't know. But there is another question by Ellen Dozen that goes back to the uh, aspect uh, we treated formerly. That is, thinking relationally makes me appreciate how arbitrary certain archaeological categories are, such as populations, groups, types, but these are still useful when we make comparisons. Perfect, perhaps we need both. Yes, yeah, I, I think so. And it, it's maybe not a very satisfactory answer just to say, yes, yes, we need both. But um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm just reminded of a sort of a, uh, something I wrote in a volume edited by, by Tim Ingalls where, um, you know, his, his um, uh, perspective of, you know, everything's in constant flow and there's movement and there's becoming, which is very valid, of course. Um, and, uh, you know, there are maybe temporary um, knots or eddies where things sort of stabilize temporarily. Uh, that's, that's great. But, you know, I do think that when I look at sort of um, ancient artifacts, I feel that there's like a, uh, something a bit stronger than that, 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 than just a sort of temporary sort of eddy in the stream, and that there is a sort of stability in in various artifact categories or, or forms of architecture or, or whatever, and that there, there's a there's a reason for that. Um, you know, that kind of stability is has a, has a kind of cognitive function, if you like. Um, so, I think, um, yeah, sort of maintaining an awareness, and this might not sound like a uh, a firm methodological um, path, but like a, a maintaining an awareness of that sort of um, tension, that dynamic between 
changeability and, and, and stability. So, yeah, thanks for that question, Helen. Yeah. Well, the, the, this uh, this makes me think also that maybe we uh, what what we we lack a little bit. You spoke formally about the 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 fact that types are strong entities sometimes and very well defined, but the, maybe we we lost a little bit the reflection about uh, what is the definition of type and how it is changing in an information world, because in an information world maybe it is a little bit different. I don't know, but. There is another question by Maria Mina uh, that is connected with the uh, one we had all already. That is, have you considered how networks between archaeologists today may be shaping the way we interpret the past? I think this is a, obviously about the historiographical point of the research where we are. We are networked uh, and so we look for networks or or how we look for networks. Um, I haven't maybe as much as I might have done, um, but it, it does strike me when one looks at uh, different sorts of, you know, just thinking about network approaches over the past several decades, how, um, yeah, there's something about the structure of institutions, about academia, which has allowed some approaches to become um, more prevalent at a certain moment uh, as opposed to others. I mean, there was, there was um, um, very interesting work uh, in a sort of French tradition um, from uh, Jean-Claude Gardin, I think, you know, looking at some of these sorts of structural uh, tendencies and even, you know, developing network uh, uh, thinking of sorts, but it, it just didn't really get anywhere. And, you know, the, it's kind of interesting uh, case, um, you know, and there were approaches in the 80s and 90s um, as well. Um, so there's a, yeah, there's a definitely a particular institutional uh, systemic uh, bias in, in um, how we're <laughs> getting to the particular points we're at in network thinking or whatever else. But I mean, there's there's papers by um, Brugmans, uh, there's a paper by Brugmans and Peoples um, on sort of uh, analyzing bibliography and looking a bit more at that, um, if you're interested. Great. Well, I think that we don't have more questions, but if people is still willing to raise some questions, I think as we are closing, uh, so nothing is coming anymore. But I think that we we touched some of the aspect of your uh, keynote, not only in, in the archaeological point of view, but also in the trend that we will have in the future and what is happening to all of us. That's that's really been great. And uh, oh, uh, sorry, the Sophia and archaeology has bridge between them. Oh, okay. Um, I, these are comments about us, but the uh, I think that this um, this has been really, really, really interesting and uh, uh, promising for the uh, dev development of ideas out of the technicalities of social network analysis. Because I think the social network analysis is has been really strong and great in uh, uh, bringing some. Uh, some facts uh, in in focus uh, with the somehow a uh, technical from a somehow technical point of view but we still have to think a lot about what is behind this social network analysis what are the what is the ontology of the things that we are comparing and connecting and what are our thoughts about the interpretation maybe you can end with something about this if you want yes it, it's it's something i i try to address um, in that uh, paper you mentioned at the beginning in the um, in the leave Donnellan edited volume just trying to think a little bit about um, micro networks of interaction and how if one uh, uh, thinks using different ontologies that even the very uh, notion of interaction is problematic uh, and uh, if one starts thinking about interaction or processes of, in, uh, of uh, connection where something of uh, one individual is is left in the object or is carried over into the other and the other individual then 
then it one really needs to sort of work out um, you know those sorts of uh, some of the basic assumptions um, and and wonder if if network analysis is even even compatible with that. So I, I tried to say something along those lines in, in that in that paper, but uh, I, I hope that there's there's more um, connection between some of the really interesting work I think in in network um, archaeology and in in some of the approaches um, that we're seeing around uh, materiality, ontology, etc. Okay, I, I, there is an observation by Biserka Gaidarsk again about the point that uh, ideas from scholars from small countries are taken less seriously than from big countries. And this was a point raised by uh, Jozen Noistupny. But uh, I don't think that this is requires a precise answer, but uh, it is connected obviously with the idea of how uh, network archaeology or archaeologists uh, are shaped by uh, the discipline itself. What do you think? I think that uh, network analysis uh, took a development also in uh, many different countries, not only in the mainstream uh, British archaeology or uh, Anglo-Saxon tradition. Yeah, it, it seems to be I mean, I, I definitely take the point that, um, you know, that there's particular structural systemic issues around uh, language, who gets published, how do you get published, you know, all, the, all these kinds of things. Um, but, uh, but it does seem fairly well uh, distributed. I mean, I haven't really analyzed that, but there's approaches um, or uh, network approaches in, in uh, coming out of all kinds of traditions, I think. Um, Okay, great. So if there are no other questions, uh, I would ask uh, uh, if we step out or what we do. What do you think, Carl? Sure. Thank you very much, Alessandro. I, I enjoyed that. Yeah, thank, it, was, your help. it was great. Thank you. It was much. great, Carl. Thank you very much. And thank you, everybody, all the almost 300 people which attended the lecture. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.